This is Joan Conover. Deb, can you hear me? Deb, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. This is Joan Conover, Seven Seas Cruising Association. This is best practices for visioning and offshore cooking. And we're letting the webinar start up and the participants are being allowed to join. The webinar is live. And we are streaming to YouTube as well at the same time. And people are starting to build in. Give it another minute or two, Deb. Okay, hey, Joan, I don't see myself anymore. That's okay, you will. Okay. For those that are joining us, uh, Deb and I are presenting today. I'm Joan Conover, I'm the president of SSCA, but also a cruiser. And Deb Rapp and her husband, John, are cruisers and very experienced at provision. And uh, this is a new computer for me to use. And Deb is uh, in a area with poor internet. So we usually have some interesting happenings during the event. This is Seven Seas Cruising Association, Best Practices, Provisioning, and Offshore Cooking with Deb Rapp and Joan Conover. We're suggesting provisioning and best practices on board. We're going to have examples how things work on passage, thanks to Deb's work. And many thanks to Boat Gallery, Carolyn Sherlock, for the ex expertise we utilize. If you have one cook cookbook, it's the Boat Galley. And I flipped through that really quick. So anyway, Deb Rapp and her husband, John, are uh, SSCA members. And I want to welcome her to this webinar. Welcome to SSCA. And also, if you want to see after the fact this webinar, after it's recorded, it will be on YouTube on the homepage of SSCA. Go down below the picture where you see the circle, there's a YouTube button. Just hit that button. When you go to that button, you will see little thumbnails like we have best practices electronic charts. We have best practices boat surveys. And you'll also see on the far side of the SSCA webpage upcoming events. I've circled it in an oval so that you should be able to see where to find SSCA events or news because that's how we advertise our new events. These events on the YouTube are public. You can read, this. they're about an hour long and they're always showing something we consider useful for cruisers. Now, the boat galley. Um, this is the website for Carolyn Sherlock. And I would suggest that if you are wanting to provision that you use some of the ideas or all of the ideas or some of the products that she has. Deb is a, a devout user of almost everything Boat Galley and has read extensively. My best cookbook, my buddy cookbook is the Boat Galley cookbook. And Deb, if you'd like to take over, I'll stop the share here. All righty. And okay. let you take your share up. Okay. There, how's that? Looks lovely, Deb. Do you see it? Yes. Hello, everybody. Hi, everybody. I'm Debbie. And today we're going to talk a little bit about provisioning on a boat. But before I start, I want to tell you something. I'm one person. I've read the boat galley. And everything I know, I've either learned from experience or from books. There's nothing special about what I'm gonna to say today. 
All of you may have just as many good ideas as we do, even better. And at the end, you can certainly uh, jump in and we'll Q&A you. So these are just a few little ideas. Some people have other ways of doing things. This is how I do it. So we're gonna start with my first slide. First slide. It didn't, didn't move. Uh-oh. Debbie, hit play at the top. Go up and hit play. You have to play Oh, it. right. Yeah, yeah. I hit play. All right, here we are. So when Joan asked me to do this, these are the things that came to my mind right away. Considerations. And these are the things I didn't get from a book or anything. I just thought of these after 20,000 miles of cruising. Uh, I have been on two long passages. One was a uh, thousand miles and it was nine days nonstop. Wow. And the other one was a six day nonstop. And, but we sometimes do three, four, five day passages quite frequently from anywhere from Newfoundland to Grenada, Cuba, all the Great Lakes, Haiti. So we've been around. So the, the ages that I put down to consider first are how long is the passage? That's a huge one. If it's only three days, it, what you prepare is much different than if it's going to be two weeks. What things don't need refrigeration? We're going to talk about that. How much storage do you have? Critical. Where you depart from and where you're going. So if you're leaving from Martinique and heading to the Azores, you're going to be all set. You got great French food to pick from. But when you get to the Azores, you're going to have plenty of food too. So it depends on where you're going, how long you're going to be there. What's going to be available seasonal? And how many people are going to help you cook and clean up afterwards? Mm -hmm. On our boat, I do almost all the cooking and I usually clean up too. So make it simple on yourself. In a passage, you don't want to start a new recipe with a five, with five, 20, 50 different ingredients. You want to make it simple because you got to clean up afterwards. So how about one pot? Special diets of those aboard. You want to find out after you started that there are three people who are gluten-free and vegetarian and vegan. By the way, I'm vegetarian. My husband is not. And we do just fine on the boat, mostly vegetarian food. What do you like to cook and eat? Stick with what you like. Don't try something new unless you're, you're pretty sure you've tried it and you're going to like it and it's easy to cook. But stick with what you like to eat. Budget. Now, this is something that I feel strongly about because we don't have any money. A lot of people don't that are cruising. So, so what, we, what I'm going to tell you is that we take the extra money on things that we really think are worth it. Extra things like special sauces, special cheeses, uh, really high quality uh, sauces and, and special things that make a meal a little bit nicer. So we do that. We spend the money on nicer, nicer sauces, cheeses, and other things. Okay, food for those on watch. That's a whole different animal. So if you have people that are doing watch at night, you want to have a basket of stuff that they can eat and that's already prepared, snacks and those things, candy bars, uh, fruits, so, and uh, lots of coffee. Mm -hmm. Now, the, keeping the planet safe, just using green things, what things to throw overboard. There's a lot, of, a lot of different people with a lot of different opinions on what you can throw overboard. So that's going to be covered pretty extensively in other books, but uh, we'll, we'll just hit on it. Okay, this is a rhetorical question. What is wrong with this galley? Take a good look. This is our boat when we bought it. The previous owner had the boat looking like this. They never actually sailed anywhere. Mm -hmm. They kept the boat at a dock in Antigua in Jolly Harbor, and they came over from Italy and entertained. So the furniture and the woodwork is spectacular. 
but look to the left. We're going to start there clockwise. So start on the left. And what do you see? Everything that's loose. Ours does not look like that anymore. So take everything off that left uh, shelf and you're going to put five large baskets and each of the baskets, they're bamboo, each of the baskets has a different purpose. The first basket is breakfast items, almond butter, jelly. The second one is lunch items. The third one is sauces and things for dinner. The fourth one is snacks. You can go in there anytime, especially if you're on, on uh, Helm at night, and that's going to be your snack bin. And the last one I have is baking. So, so I have flour and different um, yeast, different things for making cookies and baking. And I actually cook and bake when we're underway. I do it simple. I don't make bread like Joan does, but she's going to go in and show you how to do that. So the whole left side is different. I also have a cover which comes down over all five baskets and attaches and a fiddle that goes from one side to the other. And the fiddle holds the baskets in place and with the cover over it, we're not losing anything overboard. And by the way, stow everything as if you're going to have a knockdown. Firsthand, I can tell you, we had a knockdown and we were not prepared. We thought we were, but a lot of things went flying. So prepare on a long passage, like you're going to go over to 70 degrees. All right, so look to the right. On the right, you'll see a teapot. Behind that is Coffee Central. We have tins with all of our coffee. Beyond that is a compartment. That's our new freezer. And then behind the freezer, it looks like there's a hook there with a door. That's a microwave now. So if you follow the sink, you come to the refrigerator, which you can barely see at the bottom. On the floor in front of the fridge, I have a one and a half inch pad that's made specially for the floor for your feet so that you are not slipping um, and it's very comfortable. It's a padded foam that is made for comfort for people working standing up. And if I spend two hours in there in the galley, I feel really good standing on this soft pad, I'm not going to slip. It's a good thing. All right. So here we have make your galley and make the rest of your boat ready for any situation. Or it could end up like this. This is no joke. This happened. Okay, so storing your food. Now this is you can see that cover that I made that go above those five baskets. So those five baskets, that's like a leather cover that, with a teak rail that comes down and it, it covers all the baskets. Then above it, I have uh, the baskets for fruits and vegetables. There are certain things that have to be stowed next to other things so that they don't go bad and they'll, they'll last longer. And in the book, Boat Alley, you're going to read, uh, it's too lengthy for me to go through right now, but there are certain things you don't want to store next to other things. So here's the book. This is also by Carolyn Sherlock. Everything I'm saying today was, is in this book, more than likely. Nothing terribly original, <laughs> but this book is what you really got to get. Storing food without refrigeration, and it's talking about everything you could possibly think of. Okay, we shop at farmer's markets. Now, if you happen to be leaving for your, destined, for your passage from a place that has a farmer's market, that's your best bet. There's a lot of things you can do to prepare for a 10, 12, 14, 13, 21 day passage. I have used eggs that I get from the market unwashed, unrefrigerated. And what I do is I get, I get about six to 10 dozen and I arrange it ahead of time. So they're storing, they're storing them for me and they bring them. And I Vaseline every one of them and put them into a styrofoam or plastic container made for eggs. Um, that's so that they don't get any air into the shell and get moldy. Now, m some people don't do that. Some people just turn them. Every two days, you flip them over, whatever they're in, hopefully not cardboard. You flip them over and that helps it move around so that it doesn't, so that it'll last longer. Now, you know, to test your egg, you put it in water, let it sink to the bottom and how it sinks depends on how old it is. But if it goes down to the bottom, you're good. If it rises to the top, don't eat it. 
Also, please discard all packaging and cardboard because roaches lay eggs in cardboard, no matter where you are. It can happen in, in the United States. So we take all the packaging on the dock off of, out of the packages and we bring just the food onto the boat, which I immediately wash in a vinegar and water if I'm going on a long passage. Otherwise, if, if they still have roots on them in dirt, you don't wash them. If the later you wash your, your things, the later that you clean them, the longer they'll last. Sounds crazy, but it's true. And we don't use plastic when we go shopping. We use produce bags. They're mesh, trying to keep the planet safer. And I have I have dozens of these and I, of, I often give them to people at a, at a port when we stop because I get a lot of questions about them. So I, I have extra as little thank you gifts. Mm -hmm. Also for laundry, even on the boat, in your bucket, I use echo strips. The little white strips, you tear them up into little pieces and they're completely biodegradable. So you're in the market. This was in Jolly Harbor. No, this was in Grenada. The market in Grenada is out of this world. We were getting ready for a long passage back up to St. Martin from Grenada. And we went to the market and I talked to the women at the market. I talked to them about how they prepare food, uh, what, kind of, uh, what kind of foods that they think would last longer. And I've learned so much. And, and it's a really great way to, to talk to people and meet them locally, especially the women. I had a great time at the Grenada market. And I went there many times and the same women came up to me and, and it was really fun getting to know them. I learned a lot. I learned a lot of stuff at the market. Now, this is a flying fish. These, you wake up on your deck. If you're on a longer passage, you get them almost every night and you see a bunch of these. Now, I know people who have taken a half a dozen of these and thrown them in a frying pan and man for breakfast. However, we're not major fish eaters and I wouldn't eat it anyway, but I know some people do and my cat had no interest. Our cat Nemo travels with us. Don't give it to me, I'm not eating that. That is an actual flying fish that was on the deck. She took one look at it and just didn't want any part of it. Neither do we, but some people do. This is a fish fry on a roadside in Dominican Republic. The whole fish, right from the fisherman into the oil, into your plate. So in, the, in Dominique, one of my favorite places, uh, we were up in the mountain in a friend who knew a friend and had a, lived alone and her name was Chita. And it's a long story how we found her. It's an exciting story. But when we got up there, she had, she was the only one that lived on the top of this mountain. She lived alone and she had grapefruit trees everywhere. She said, here, and I said, what are we gonna do with all those grapefruit? We're not gonna be able to eat them. And she, in time and she said you freeze them freeze a grapefruit yep and believe it or not when you take it out of the freezer a week later it it's exactly like it was when you put it in it was such a surprise okay so then some things are worth splurging for now you save a lot of money by not going out to eat at a restaurant so and we don't and at passage you can't so Obviously, what we do is buy the really good stuff so that we enjoy our meals. Now, some of the things you want to splurge on, or you don't, but if you do, a good one's a bread maker. I do not have a bread maker. And the other one is a pressure cooker. I do not have a pressure cooker. Everything I cook is in one good saute nonstick pan. I got it from a supplier, a supplier restaurant place. It cost me $85 and it's the best pan and I've been using it for years and it's the only pan I use 95% of the time. So good storage, really important. I use reusable Ziploc bags and I'll show you what they are. Special sauces. This is what you spend money on, dried fruit. Um, you know what we really like? We like the, the um, Marjul dates. The really good dates, they're so much better than the cheaper dates. And we use them especially for snacks, nuts, favorite quick snacks, favorite cheeses. It's a gift to have a frozen or prepared specialty item and have that easily made on a passage for dinner. So I'll tell you what we did in St. Martin's. There's a vegetarian restaurant called Top Carrot. We went in, we had a couple of meals there. We got to know the owner and the cook and it's a vegetarian restaurant. 
And so I told him we were leaving on a six day uh, passage. And he said, I will make you six dinners. And he made us six vegetarian dinners and he froze them three days ahead. So when we were ready to leave on our passage, we went and got the frozen, which he had all wrapped to go right to the boat into the freezer. What a gift having those already made dinners. Healthy snacks, fruits, nuts, gorp. Remember gorp? And you know what gorp is? Then you're probably as old as I am. All right, so good candy is good too. Now we were in Martinique and this was our hitchhiker friend, outboard Gary. He came with us all the way from St. Martin to Grenada, another long story. And this is dark chocolate. I mean, when we're in Martinique, you just splurge and you get the good stuff. The Lorraine beer, the 70% cocoa. Martinique is a great place to provision. So in St. Vincent and St. Lucia, we met a boat boy who came over to help us. He was making a reed. And I told him we were leaving soon and he, I needed vegetables. And he said, well, there's no real vegetable place around here, but I know someone who has a farm. I could be back in an hour. I said, that would be great. If you would go get me fresh vegetables, I would really, really be grateful. So he was a sweet man. He came back about an hour and a half later with this. And those big green things that look like spinach are callaloo. And they're wonderful. Of course, you talk to people who live there about how to cook things. And I did clean everything with vinegar and it had already been picked and it wasn't dirt, didn't have dirt on it. So um, I just washed them off with vinegar. Now those are bananas and plantains. We don't bring them on the boat anymore, but this was in our second year of cruising. And uh, we don't bring them on the boat anymore because fruit flies are impossible to get rid of. Okay, how do you do your coffee? Well, there's a million ways to do coffee. This is how we do it, French press. If we have just John on the boat, we use the one on the right. If we have company, we use the one on the left. It's just a French press. It's a double walled stainless steel French press. So easy. I have a little grinder. We buy only whole beans, especially if we're in a place like Puerto Rico or Grenada. Yeah, they have amazing coffee beans and roasteries. So we provisioned at that place and we had we had a lot of beautiful people that we met to talk to about how to do it. And then we actually ended up buying these. Now those nonstick pads, I have rolls of that and I put them on everything, especially underway. If you're, you wouldn't leave two coffee pots sitting there underway. But that's where, that's my coffee central behind there. I keep tins with my beans that I ground up from the, uh, from the inverter with a little tiny grinder. And I do about once a week, I grind beans, put them in a tin and we use it. So the nonstick pan, uh, the, it's sitting on a white, what, what you're seeing is the stove. That's the cover on our three burner stove. And we made that um, at Home Depot or Lowe's. And it's, we, we bought, we made one to fit each of our, our freezer, our refrigerator our, in our stove. So we have three of those. So when we provision for seafood, we don't eat a lot of seafood, but when we do, we don't go to the market. We go down to the pier. When the fishermen come in, it's the best time to get fish where the locals get fish. They don't go to the American supermarket. They go down to the pier. The fishermen had just arrived and everybody was rushing down to the dock in Grenada. So this was in the Dominican Republic in Samana. Uh, we pull in and the guy in the motorcycle comes over and he says, I will take you to a, a market. And I said, oh, good, good. We need food. And we, we pulled over. I mean, we, we got out, we went with him and he take drops us off and goes, here we are. And it was this tiny little Americanized supermarket and everything in there was in a can or processed. I came back out and said, no, this is not where we shop. I want to go where you shop for your family. He said, you may not like it. And I said, we'll love it. And there we are. Yep. Pretty rustic, pretty primitive, great stuff. Wash very carefully. Oh, next to this, there's a whole table of guys, the men playing dominoes, slapping the dominoes. That's, that's what you do in the Caribbean. You slap dominoes. Make sure you have a domino set. I grow herbs on the back of the boat. Um, 
I grow lettuces and herbs. And so a lot of a lot of these things, you you know what they are, basil, rosemary. Um, well, I've tried different ways. Sometimes it works. It doesn't work. It works well when we were in the Great Lakes. Um, when we were cruising on a long passage, sometimes I start to cut them within the next two or three days because salt water and salt air don't they don't love it. And you have to use fresh water every day. So if you're using fresh water, you're careful. This is the other way I had them in the very back. They're really close to the water and um, they don't last real long on a long voyage. They'll last a week, they'll last two weeks if you start them early enough. But when it got rough out, I have rocks on the bottom, so it's heavy. The bottom of the, of the base, the planter is heavy. So it doesn't slide around. And if it does, I'll have to tie it with ropes. But I moved it up under the dodger. I had cherry tomatoes and aloe for burns and basil and chives, lots of stuff. And um, I moved it under the dodger and that was fine. Also, it's fun to try out something new. This is, this is a fruit, I think. <laughs> well, I thought it was a red crab or something, but it turns out to be dragon fruit. It's horrible. But it's fun to try something new. We didn't like it. Okay, so we get to a farmer's market in Lake Huron and we see these. And I said, those look like long green beans, like the Asian long green beans. No, no, no. This is scarlet scape. Scape. Never heard of it. What do you do with scape? I didn't think it was edible. It's just the green part comes off the garlic. Yep, you can eat it. So I took it home and made pesto, scape and basil and chives. And I made five quarts of pesto and froze them. So easy to make pesto. And I stopped using Ziploc bags that year. Those are plastic Ziploc bags, but I don't use them anymore. Now I use Zip Top. And these are uh, they're they're very sturdy and they zip across just like a Ziploc bag, but they're reusable and they're very uh, they're very sturdy. So they come like this, like glasses, like like envelopes or sandwiches, or just anyway. These are the best thing I've ever bought. Saves the earth. You're not putting plastic into into the landfill or putting it in a country when you get to your destination that that lets it go and get out into the ocean, which is what we ran into so many places. We found the garbage on the beach that, they, that you took into the, uh, to the boat boys and had them take the garbage and it ends up on the beach. So we use these also for fat to keep fat good. I don't refrigerate my fats. So my olive oil, coconut oil, coconut butter and ghee. These things can last for a month or longer without refrigeration. This is what I use. Now, um, Joan wanted me to mention water. We don't have a water maker. Um, we fill up all of our tanks with water. We make sure that we put bleach in a little bit. We clean them with vinegar and we, we clean them out real good and then we put bleach in them. So it doesn't taste good. Um, we also have spring water that we bring along as well and we catch rainwater. So to make sure that our water is clean if we're drinking it from the tank or from rainwater, we purify it. I wanted to show you this because this is our purifier at home in my kitchen. We live in the country three months out of the year. When it's winter, we come north to ski. So in my little ski chalet, I have a well and the well water goes into a nickin. This is gravity. I pour the water into the top and then it goes through all those filters, including the charcoal, which takes everything out of it, including the good minerals. At the bottom of the tank, you will see mineral rocks. So it actually introduces minerals back into the water before it comes out into the spigot. It's just gravity, no pumps. You just pour water into the top wherever you get it. But this is what we use on the boat. Instead of the um, hanging water closet, hanging closet for, for uh, water, for um, raincoats, we don't use it for that. We use it for our Berkey our Berkey water system. And it's attached very carefully uh, with clamps um, to the boat in, inside of the closet. And it's right next to the sink in the galley, so it's perfect. So this is a, a stainless steel, big Berkey. And the water goes into the top and it goes through the two uh, filters on the left. This is, this is expensive, it's over $300. Again, 
we don't buy, we don't have a water maker, so we make sure that the water that we get from different places is cl is clean, and 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 it's free of viruses and bacteria. This water Berkey filters are the best that you can buy in terms of cleaning your water. It's a little tricky because you do have to support it somehow because it'll move around. You see over on the left, it's on a, a stand. Well, we don't use it as a stand. We have it uh, placed on a shelf in the in the closet and it's it's held in place very carefully. So you can put mineral rocks in the bottom and then it'll soak in into the mineral. The minerals will soak into the water and come out. It's important if you're cleaning your water, especially with reverse osmosis, that you, you take all the minerals out of it, that you put them back in or take a lot of mineral supplements. This is something else we've turned to. We don't bring pop, we don't bring canned food, we don't bring, I mean, canned drinks or, or plastic drinks on the boat. We use the water that we purify and to give it a little flavor, we use stir. There's no sugar in the one that we buy because we don't like to use a lot of sugar. So alternative, this is an alternative to bottled plastic drinks. It's only two and a half inches high and it makes 20 drinks. You just take it and squirt it into your water. This, is a, this has been a lifesaver for us because we don't drink pop or soda. So we just drink water, little black cherry flavor. So night watches, you wanna have easy things. Patagonia provisions are great. Um, and they're all natural, no artificial anything and no sugar, no added sugar. So it's, um, it's fruit, you can buy all kinds of them. Patagonia is something where we go to a lot, especially for uh, long passages. We don't wanna prepare a lot of food and you got lots of snacks for your night passages. This, I bought six boxes and that means we have we can have sockeye salmon, which I'm not even a fish eater. This salmon is fantastic. It's smoked, so it's so good. And it makes one whole meal for two people. About six boxes, it's worth every cent. Also, for my meat eating husband, we bought a smoked cured ham. It's called a country ham and it's wrapped, it's dry, smoked, and cured, dry cured smoked. And it's called country ham. And if you buy these, we bought three hams and two things of bacon and they're wrapped in a linen material. Um, and we put them um, you know, in a dry place under the floor and it lasted four months, a long time. And it's absolutely fine. Refrigeration is overrated. Okay, I'm finishing up now. So well, here's our galley, my sweet husband and me. So I would like to tell you, make good food. Prep ahead of time as much as you can prior to the trip and enjoy your meals because eating is the best part of passage making. It makes the passage making easier and more enjoyable if you have good food. I love making good food for a happy man who loves my cooking. When we get to our destination, we always thank the people that helped us, especially the port officers. And this was in La Baguera, Puerto Rico. And when we got there from Grenada, we met people right away and we had a, a shrimp curry meal for them on the boat. Then you can use up all the stuff that you brought for your, for your provisioning that you didn't use up. And they're so grateful, great fun. Of course, there's always cleanup. So be careful on your passage that you don't have a meal like that. And I wanted to just clarify that countless people have eaten in this kitchen and gone on to lead normal lives. It's true, even with our cooking. All right, I am through and I've enjoyed talking to you. And now it's Joan's turn. Take it away, Joni Conover. Hi, and I see Deb. Look, Loretis Cordero has joined what? us. Hi. Yeah. And the reason you're on this webinar is because you're a brand new cruiser. Yes. And you're listening to this. Uh -oh. And we're going to ask, have you ask some questions at the very end of this after we get done presenting. Okay. That you're listening to this. They are looking for a boat. 
they're sailors. He does a lot of boat deliveries. Excellent. He's also vice president of SSCA. And we're hoping they get on board a nice big boat for their six foot four or seven, six, seven? Six, foot, six, seven. Six, seven, son. So let me share my screen and go back to the presentation. Um, here we go. Hi, Lourdes. How are you? <laughs> so if the two of you would mute your um, boxes. And we're back to the boat galley. And remember, we talked about the products she has. We think they're wonderful. And the boat galley um, cookbook has all those funny items that you don't know what they are when you get down to the Caribbean. Um, it's almost like a whole new world. They have ground provisions. If you don't know what ground provisions are, it's anything that grows in the ground. And there's things that grow down there that we don't know about. And they have unusual fruits. So you really need a little bit of information because they'll bring stuff out to your boat and you don't know what you've got. You don't know how to cook bread fruit. You don't know how to cook, uh, what to do with uh, star fruit. Um, and there's quite a few different things. When you go to the markets, you can ask the people uh, in Dominica, Dominican Republic, um, most of the down island areas, um, they have the wonderful farmer's markets. They have that in Europe too but we're familiar with most European food. In the Caribbean, they have things we are not familiar with. One of the things that I found surprised about was um, the callaloo, but they also have amaranth and they call that spinach. So you just need to know how to cook it, but find that in the boat galley. Now, lessons learned from several transatlantics and trips to the tropics. We have a 51 foot boat. We usually sail with a larger crew. Uh, we have two, we went across the Atlantic with our two teenagers um, and uh, two extra people. So I was cooking for six and we had a 50 foot boat. And what I learned was you really have to be organized. Our boat has a 10 cubic foot freezer that keeps it uh, very, very cold below zero and uh, a 10 cubic foot refrigerator. You need to be very careful with your refrigeration and make sure it stays cold because you can get yourself sick if you don't really watch the temperature again. And the same for the freezer. Always get something for your freezer that shows if something's defrosted because you may have an issue happen. It's happened to us a couple of times and we had to dump all our food overboard once. The meat made my husband cry. But I would suggest that you prepare meals for offshore passengers ahead. You bag your meal items together, mark the bag. If it's in a freezer, pre-cook and package your meals, just kind of like Bev did with uh, the, the young gentleman in St. Martin's, the cup carrot. Um, package your meals, figure out what you're gonna eat. People offshore eat high calories. I can easily lose 20 pounds on a, a 10 day voyage and I don't have to diet. You're about a 3,500 calorie a day. So you have to put that into your meal plans. You could snack away all you want. Um, I not only cook, I'm the galley chef, but uh, with the number of crew we have, at least they can do the cleanup, but I organize the food and make sure it's done. But then I also take a shift and I do all of the communications to get the weather information and haul that down um, and help the captain make a decision on, on routing and whatnot. I suggest, that you list the meals and instructions for those meals, pick up a crew member as a cook just in case. Everyone has duties, but should, each of you should have a backup, especially if you have several people. Um, Deb and her husband sail a little bit differently than we do, but we um, usually sail a, a bigger crew. Um, I'm, um, I'm handicapped, so most people aren't pretty aware of that. And I can no longer do safe deck work. Uh, because of issues. Um, so be sure you have a backup person. And that also goes for your communications and radio and stuff like that. I put loose everywhere. You will also see on Carolyn Sherlock, she has a VHF radio list of channels and whatnot. I do the same for, the, uh, for my SSB radio. And I do the same instructions for my uh, Iridium satellite uh, systems because we sail with a lot of different ways to reach out. Um, you can also see uh, communications uh, 
presentation next week with uh, Louis Sotero, who helped develop a lot of things, but that's not a topic for this one. Baking bread. Okay, we bake bread. And I do have a bread maker. It does it in 60 minutes, so I can start my uh, gen set in the morning when I'm uh, topping up batteries and um, running the water maker. We do have a water maker. And we'll run the, everything for about an hour in the morning and we're done. So I make my bread in the morning. Uh, baking bread, uh, yeast does not have the nutrients it needs in reverse osmosis water. I don't, can't tell you how many people have come up to me in the islands, especially some of the locals when they suddenly get reverse osmosis water and their bread, pizza, or whatever for their business doesn't rise. You need to add nutrients to the dough if you're using pure RO water and you never know when you are. Or you could add a quarter cup of fresh ocean water and use that as a salt, but that makes your bread just really poop up. And I'm warning, many U.S. and foreign ports use reverse osmosis now for water. So you kind of need to add conditioners. And I'll show you something I use. Now, in the Caribbean, they have ground provisions, but the other thing they have a lot of is rice, rice dishes. And they use, in some areas, uh, balsamic rice. And I've always had a terrible time to get something up, and Deb doesn't, but I do. And so finally, I got a big sack of the stuff from the Caribbean, shipped it in, and what I thought was four pounds turned out to be 40 pounds, so I have a whole bunch of rice that I can ship to anybody if they want a sample. Um, the recipe says you take one cup of rice, you soak it in a lot of water for 30 minutes, you drain it many times so it's clear. Then you take that rice grain, add two cups of water, salt, and simmer it for 15 minutes and fluff. It will make the most wonderful, fluffy, individual grain um, rice that I've ever seen. But it's a very different rice than the normal rice that we see here in the US. Just be aware that's probably what you're getting when you buy the rice in the little packages down there. The small groceries in those small countries, they kind of pack, make their own packages. And if you're getting them from um, food from the larger stores, you really need to make sure you check the date on everything because they'll sell anything, no matter if it's expired or not. And with your grains and those kind of uh, foods, you really need to make sure they aren't like six years old. For your fresh produce, and I wanted to comment on things like dirt and fruit and um, herbs or growing things on the boat. Be sure you check with customs for the country you're going into because they've had some real problems with people bringing in seeds when they are non-GMO and messing up some of the native crops and stuff. So just follow the rules for customs on produce. But when you buy produce locally and um, wash the produce and prep it, get rid of the dirt, bacteria, bugs, and um, get rid of the packaging. No cardboard, no paper on board. Do it on the dock or do it on the deck and rinse it off really well. You haven't lived until you get roaches on your boat. And they're not the great big, big roaches that are icky. They're little teeny ones and there's millions of them. And if you get infested with roaches, they'll eat everything in your boat, including the, um, yeah, <laughs> Lawrence is, is looking at me going, Ugh. Uh, they'll eat everything. And they're, they're not the big roaches, they're little tiny ones. And they, you have one and you have a thousand in a day. And then for cooking, cook smart. Heat and humidity in the tropics is miserable. Use instant thicker, thickeners and use a pot to cook in, not an oven. And I'll go over that a little bit. Okay, for baking bread, I add a dough conditioner. And I also add a little teaspoon of wheat gluten. So I carry my flour in uh, packaged up in plastic containers that are Ziploc and I reuse them. And I bring a dough conditioner and everything else, but I package everything in some sort of container because the humidity is terrible. But there's also something people aren't familiar with as much in something called Easy Gel. It's an instant thickener, no heat, but you can make gravy out of it or you can make jello out of it or anything. And I always have some of that because there are times when I want to do something, I don't want to heat up my boat. And that's an easy way to do a chocolate dessert or something. And your captain thinks you're wonderful and you haven't done anything. Okay, first of all, Carolyn's book, The Boat Gallery. And then for onboard use, I use a pressure cooker. I get one with the tall sides stainless steel. 
and it can clamp on the boat. And I'll show you what I'm doing. Because we've gone into some big seas. We haven't had a really bad knockdown. We had almost knockdown. We've had stuff slide all over the place. Um, that was when we were coming to the Cape Birds. No, yeah, I think to the Cape Birds at one time. Anyway, we got into a low off of Africa. It was not fun. And there was no engine, there was no gen set, and it was totally interesting. Um, the cookbooks that I like, Good Food Fast with Bob Warden, um, Slow Food Fast. I love Miss Dickey's Big Book of Pressure Cooking because she covers everything you can do with a pressure cooker. And it's not fancy turnip and parsnip stew, it's how you can do stuff. Kindle has that book, um, it's a pressure cooker cookbook. And I would suggest you get some of your stuff on Kindle because the book dies, the paper dies offshore with the humidity. Now, pressure cookers for a big pot. They come a long way. Stainless, double bottom, wing tie down clamps. I have one on the right side that shows one that I have and I've used for years. I use it for everything. I use it like baking as an oven on top of the stove. But see those wings on the side, those black handles? I tie that down on top of my stove. I don't care if my stove's gimbled or not. Those pots and pans can be um, lofted across the boat. So I clamp, have, if you have one pot, you can do that with a stainless pot and just know how to use stainless. Um, you can also use it for a water maker in a pinch. You can put salt water in it. You put uh, on the vent pipe, you put a, a, a thing of copper and then drop it into some cold water and you heat the pot up and heat it in the sun and you will be making water. Does it work fast? No. In a desperation, does it work? Yes. Also in a seaway, you're gonna be slopping back and forth and you want high sides on your pain because the worst accidents happen in the galley, the burns. And Deb mentioned the pad on the floor, very important. Um, it can cushion some of your falls. The times I've been hurt in my boat has been in the galley. Once coming off a really big wave and I landed straight legged and I didn't have a pad, it hurt my back. And um, I ended up burnt. I don't like to use my oven offshore because of that. So I use my pot. On the right side, we found SSCA, Seven Seas Cruising Association, has been around for a long time. And we just found this wonderful repository of all of the old newsletters, one a month since 1952 with hand-drawn images. And as you can see, Lorna D was using a pressure cooker, the old fashioned pressure cooker. She filled it up too high and I think it kind of made a mess of the cow. But she's got that story. We're gonna be starting to publish those in our monthly bulletins and they are a hoot. They are talking all over the place, what it used to be like cruising. But then like for Haiti, it hasn't changed. In 2000, um, in 1959, they talked about Haiti and going to Port-au-Prince and the police walked around with a gun to protect their boat. And I'm looking at that document and I'm realizing in 2011, we went to Haiti, we were helping. And guess what? The police went around, sat on the boat with an AK-47. It has not changed. So there's some good stories and there's some old stories. But you'll see that's the pressure cooker that I use. And I'm now going to show you some examples. Best practicing and cooking. And you can see on the right side that that's a cheesecake. And you see that pan with a hole in it. It's sitting on a propped up, but I had the lid on the top. You see the whole pressure cooker on the um, left side. I use a locking lid and I bake in that pressure cooker. And I'll tell you, it makes the world's best cheesecake in 20 minutes. So it's still at what I call a cruiser's microwave and I bake in it too. Um, it's a cheesecake heaven. I will put a tint it a little bit to keep the water off the top and then you can see it. So I just, um, the way that's got a tube up the center is very much like an on the oven. If you want a stovetop oven separate from that, check with Carolyn's site about the Omni oven. She has one of those and it's aluminum. I happen to like stainless steel, but I'm using my pot for a lot of things. And I've got a big crew. I have a crew of usually six. So we're cooking big meals. And even if I take it frozen out of the freezer, I can slam it in that pressure cooker and cook it in, and get it cooked in 20 minutes. It, well, it depends on what it is, but usually I'll have stuff already prepackaged and shaped carefully to fit into the pressure cooker and then put water in the bottom of it and steam it. And I do pot and pot cooking too. Here's my bread. 
And I bake that in my pressure cooker, my top of the oven. Um, you have to be careful doing that. You have to have a good pan, but to get it brown, I just put egg wash on it. But I'll show you at the end the other trick. But I put an egg wash on it and it bakes beautifully. Here's, I'm setting up for a demo of pot and pot cooking. And how I do that is I put um, something in the bottom. It can be tuna cake. So that you put a pan on top of a tuna can and don't have it directly on the bottom. And you put your cup of water in there for 30 minutes of, of cooking. So figure one cup of water for 30 minutes or 35 minutes for steam in a pressure cooker. Steps for pot and pot cooking. I will do three layers in the pressure cooker at one time. I'll do my main dish, I'll do a vegetable, and I'll have rice. And I'll cook it all together in one pot. And I'll show you that. But I will either have it already frozen in a round container like shape, build it, and then freeze it. But here I'm going to show you just building it without doing that ahead of time. So you can see I just layer uh, the easy pasta that's already cooked to make lasagna, uh, make the sauce. And then I have a lifting system that you can either use just foil. And we use foil better than any saran wrap. I would get foil ahead of saran for anything. And I also use uh, parchment paper a lot. So pot and pot cooking, you can use pot and pot for almost anything. Any pot that you have in the kitchen you could go in that pressure cooker, as long as you support it off the bottom and wrap it up with foil, or if it has a lid. You can actually buy, you can see on the right, you can see the pan sitting on top of something else. And they have sets of this thing, of these pots you can find on the internet. Uh, they have them either the stainless steel, which I like, or they do have them with silicone. Anything used with that instant pot, you know, that's a push button electronic thing, uh, works. The reason I have an instant pot, but I like my stainless steel pressure cooker that I use on the stove, because electronics die in the saltwater environment. So they'll last for part of a trip, and then you're going to dump it in a dumpster when you get to Antigua. I use a lifter if I've got a large amount in the pot. And what you see at the top is a covered amount of uh, the lasagna that you can see over on the right side. And on the left side at the bottom is a chicken dish that I just cook straight in the pot. You just have to be sure that you do not burn the bottom of some of these dishes when you've got heat, hot flames in the bottom of your pot. You, you, the way you use a pressure cooker, you bring it up to temperature, get something to boil, put the lid on, put the pressure on it, bring it up to start when it starts to jiggle for, for pressure and then turn the heat down and just keep a little jiggle. And then you're usually, you won't have any problem, but you never leave it by itself cooking. You need, never leave anything on the stove cooking. Okay, here I am building a demo. You'll notice a few things. See that spray? I use it heavily. Um, but if you don't have that, a little bit of uh, olive oil on a paper towel or a cloth, just wipe it in the dish, but always use as much as you can spray. Even spray your spoons and stuff because it's much easier to wash stuff off if you've got some sort of foil or something that will help from getting you um, so much of a mess. You can see the scraps that I made out of foil. And I also lined the pan with foil so I could just take the foil out, roll it up, compress it really good, and it can go overboard. You don't put plastic overboard, but aluminum can go overboard. Three miles out. International. So here I am with one of the cook sets. There's actually three layers in this. Um, you have a top layer, it could be a dessert. You could have a bottom layer, it could be rice, or it could be your main dish and then a rice layer. So you would have all of those cooking together in the pot at the same time. And I call it my microwave. And you can see this one is a lifter. You'll see that also on, uh, you can get them from Amazon. Just look for instant pot, uh, you know, you stuff and, and you'll find them. Just make sure they fit your pot. And here again is the lifter I made myself, and that is the lasagna cook. And here you can do anything um, that goes like um, this is a, a, a recipe for um, a Spanish dish. And I just piled it in there and cooked it. And then I said I'd show you how I get things brown. Well, I tried a couple different things. One of the things that I like if you really wanted to try it and you have the electricity on board 
and you can contain it in your boat is getting one of those air fryer tops you put on top of your pressure cooker and it makes it into an air fryer. Well, also brown things like chicken doesn't brown unless you brown it all before you start your pressure cooker up. And then the other thing, which I thought was a good idea until I tried it, because it scared me that the Jesus out of me, was a blowtorch, you know, to do your cream brulee. Well, unfortunately for me, I have a flame fear. So when I first started using, I tried using that, I decided it was not for me, but it might be for someone else if you're used to using it. But open flames on boats, I'm just not comfortable. So I'm, my boat's all electric. So now, Deb. Laura Booth, do you have any questions? Does any of the do any of your participants have any questions? Let me look and see. Does anyone have a hand up? I see Andy's there. Chase, Danny, hi Danny, Jason. Oh, we have quite a, we have a lot of people here. Now, Joan, do you recommend a rice cooker? Because I know that you we use a rice cooker at home almost uh, for for rice. Is that something that you recommend having on a boat, even if it's just a small one? I'm not the best cook, so I like, I like simplicity. If you use a lot of rice and you're comfortable using a rice cooker and you have the electricity on your boat, try it. I will still have a pressure cooker because electricity may go away and you may need to figure out some way how to cook. I do carry an extra small um, portable stove at, at, at Canyon on the boat in case something happens to my electricity, I can still cook. And we do have a propane tank on the back with the grill, so I could always cook on the back grill. But again, I'm nervous about flames. Um, okay. But the rice cooker works great. Just be aware that it may not live a long time. Right. So what else did you find? Did you see anything interesting? Do you bake bread? I don't, actually. I, I, but I think I will start once we get on the boat. <laughs> You might want to practice ahead of time. It isn't hard yeah. to do. Yes. And 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 and, and Tom loves bread, fresh bread, I'm sure, right? Yes, yeah, he does. And he has a question yeah. here no. as well. Listen, fantastic presentation. I've been here next to Lourdes. I just wanted to add that I do a lot of deliveries with a friend of mine who's a captain and pretty good cook, but not as good as his wife. <laughs> and the wife sometimes makes us like, uh, she'll make us lasagna. She'll make us chili. She'll make us beef stew, uh, bean. That's and, what and she'll fro freeze them up in these uh, Ziploc containers. And my goodness, all we have to do is microwave them for a few minutes and they make a fantastic meal. They keep us fit for seven to 10 days. That's what Deb said earlier. Remember, Deb, you had a, a chef in uh, one of the islands. Hey, Deb, are you there? Uh, yeah, I'm here. A chef in one of the islands. Yeah, cut carrot. The vegetarian. I, the, the, the vegetarian. Oh, 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 a restaurant. A restaurant. Yeah, the restaurant chef. Yep, he made us, he made us some vegetarian meals at a time. And yeah, that was wonderful. I have a question here. It said, Deb, do you beforehand? You mentioned salted ham. I'd, I'd, I'd also like to Can add. Can last? Does bacon also? Oh, well, we can't say it again, Bill. Okay, should I answer the question, Joan? On the salted ham, let me look. You at. mentioned this is from Kirsten. Yes, uh, it's Kirsten. under yeah. From you can Kirsten. get the bacon. You can get the pre-done bacon. We, I am right now in Smithfield, Virginia, which has Smithfield country ham, mm -hmm. and you can get the pre-packaged bacon and everything else. It will last for a long time. Deb, where did you get your hams from? Costco. Uh, it was Tennessee. It was a country store in Tennessee. I have searched all over trying to find that place, and I unfortunately couldn't find it for this presentation. But it was a country store, and it has to have, it uh, has to say, smoked, dry, cured country ham and bacon. And we bought three hams and two bacon. Lasted months. No refrigeration. Smithfield, I believe, has to be refrigerated. No, no, they do have the salted ham, the dry salted ham too, but you have to ask for it. And remember, you do have to soak oh, it okay. before you first, you <laughs> slice off a chunk, but you have to soak it to get the salt out because they're pretty salty. Um, but since you're, Deb, since you're coming through the Chesapeake and coming down here towards Virginia, stop and get some uh, Smithfield hams and Hampton before you head out again. 
good place to get him. Yeah, uh, we've bought Smithfield ham often, but um, not so much on the boat. Uh, I do buy I do buy stuff for for John. I'm not, you know, we don't have a whole lot of meat on the boat, but. Yeah, we'll stop in Smithfield. A Virginia country ham is amazing right. if you eat meat. Yeah, and the other thing is you can get a lot of yeah. other, like um, these are standard. You can get a lot of these prepackaged, uh, um, dehydrated things. There's a, Amish stores have a lot of them. Just be sure you put them in smaller containers and make sure they're really fastened down well to keep the moisture out. And if you get something like dried eggs or dried milk or anything don't get big packages get little ones because when you open it once you open something like that the humidity and the salt air can really get into it and uh, but we but you know um now deb i have a, I have a question for deb which electronic uh, cookware would you highly recommend if there was just one that you would take on your boat i know joan likes the pressure cooker uh, what about you, Deb? Um, I don't use any electronic devices, nor do I recommend them. I'm totally different than most people. No bread maker, no pressure cooker. No, well, that's not electronic. No electric things. The only electric thing I use is a tiny little grinder. Mm. And I use it with my, with my inverter. And I plug it in and you can do it underway. And um, I only grind things with it. I grind beans. There is one other thing, I, I take it back. There's one other thing I, I use and that is a hand blender. So you know what that is, an immersing hand blender? That's what I use um, when I'm doing smoothies or mashed potatoes or I want to have something smooth consistency, mostly morning smoothies. Like a bullet. And I use a hand yeah. immersion. Yeah, a bullet is good. They're small and so, they're pretty good. Is that what you yeah. have to have is a bullet? Like a neutral bullet? No way. No way. Okay. No, 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 no. I would never use a bullet. Um, I use a plastic container, like a, a pitcher, and I take a immersion blender. It's a hand immersion oh yes oh, yeah. do you know what it is yes it, it looks like i'll go get one it's thick. i'll go get it now yeah. i have one of those i make mashed potatoes with them yeah well i have we have another question on using a slow cooker and the problem with a slow cooker is it's a slow cooker and you're going to have have electricity for hours so I would suggest something like an instant pot that also could be a slow cooker. So when you're at shore on shore power, you could use the slow cooker if you wanted to. But in the tropics, if that's where you're going to be, that's going to make your boat really hot. hot. So you need to do consider either using, um, you know, some sort of stovetop pot or something like an instant pot, knowing that it probably wouldn't survive very long. Wow. And also consider that those things need well, to be tied down because they can slop around even at the dock. So you don't want to be hit in the head with one of those things or dropped on your foot. That really hurts too. Um, hey, Joan. Yeah. Hey, Joan. I don't see myself on the screen anymore. Can you see me? Yes. Oh, yes. And I can see you with that gadget. That's an electronic gadget. Okay, here it is. <laughs> yes. That's this is an immersion blender. So I put my things into a, a, a plastic container and down, turn it on. That's, this is the electronic thing I use for smoothies and making um, like pesto. I used it for pesto. I use it for anything you'd use a blender for. So I use it for everything. The only other machine I have is a little tiny grinder for beans. And I also use it for seeds. And I make my own curries. Um, so I use a lot of dry pots and then I, I blend them with my little coffee grinder. Okay. Yeah, and you can also get a handheld um, a chopper mixer thing that's, that's like, um, it's about a, a, a quart or two quart bowl with a handle and a little grinder on the top that actually spins blades in the bottom. 
and that's not electronic, but that's something. I have one of those, not a big one, because, um, you know, electricity goes away. And after that bad experience we had where we had no nothing on that boat for 10 days, um, we were a true sailboat. Um, you learn and appreciate what electricity does for you. I don't see any more chat or questions. Um, do you have any more questions, anyone? No? Nope. Well, we've had a wonderful time. Um, remember that this will be um, made available on um, Seven Seas. And we have some events coming up. If you like Deb and her husband, John, and she's very bubbly, you will meet Deb at the uh, Annapolis Boat Show for both shows. She, she and her husband are working the shows. For, I think she'll be up there with either her camper and her boat's gonna be um, in the bay. Um, and before that, the SSCA GAM is in Maryland, uh, September 30th to October 2nd. You will find us all there. We tell stories. We have a great time for three days. And Pam Wall is going to be keynote speaker. So she has some wonderful experiences. Um, and then in July of this summer, we're going to have an event up in Penobscot Bay um, at the uh, Sail, Power, and Steam Museum. And Keith Davey and Nicole Dunbar are hosting that one. And that's a get together where you can meet other cruisers and sailors. Uh, we have a lot of ex excitement because since COVID's kind of maybe eased a bit, we're able to do these events again now. I'm seeing some questions coming up. Lots of notes and people are thinking from Danny. Wealth of experience. <laughs> well, thank you guys. We really, and gals, we really appreciate that. And if you like this kind of presentation and stuff, go to YouTube and look at what we put up. We have boat surveys and it's useful for you if you're getting a boat, selling a boat, or just want to be sure that your boat's in shape. We have one on boat safety checks produced by the chief um, marine engineer for the Caribbean 1500. And he talks about how they check boats and things to look at on a boat so, you're, so you know you're sa as safe as you can be. Um, and then we will have an event down in St. Augustine, Florida in November. And we are also having an October event in San Diego. So we're covering a lot of ground and you're more than welcome and invited to visit us. And thank you very much. And I will um, stop this share. And Deb, thank you so much. Yes. Everybody's enjoyed your presentation. You are a hoot. <laughs> <laughs> you are so much fun. <laughs> you fun. have no idea. <laughs> I'm so being fit. Well, you know, you know me. Yeah. Hey, I wanted to tell you, I'm headed to Newfoundland and Labrador. Ah, uh, yes, I know. We're going up to Newfoundland and Labrador. We're going we're north. Also going, you're also so going to Europe and you're going to go on a, a cruise on, the, on a boat. And you're going to go to Scotland and everything. By the time we see you this fall, you're going to be so well-seasoned a traveler that we you won't even be able to talk to us lowly oh. cruisers. <laughs> oh, well, I may still talk to you. I mean, I might. I might. Depending, you know, if I feel like it. If you're really <laughs> nice to me. Well, if you get me eggs you. again and bake bread for me. I'll do it. I'll do it. Hey, I'll see you guys. I'll see everybody in Annapolis. Flirties, thank you for your questions and answers. Yes. And have a good night, Bye, everybody. everybody.